Welcome to Gray Maybe, a limited series podcast and social experiment based on this season's topic, grief. My name is Jillian Schmitz. I'm a professional dancer, actor, teacher, author, artist, and cat lover. Through my own personal journey of recovery, I found that things aren't just black or white or a simple yes or no. For me, in my recovery, there has been mostly gray area and a lot of maybes. In most of my stories, you can find the gray maybe. I'll be sharing my own process through personal stories and interviews with others in an effort to help investigate the process of and recovery through grief. If you'd like to share your story, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're using to catch future episodes of Gray Maybe. A note before we start. My stories and the stories of others on this podcast are told through the lens of our own experience. The revelation of our process is ours to tell. If you disagree with the views or stories on this podcast, know that we are not speaking on anything other than our own experiences and viewpoints. Take what you like and leave the rest. Nothing expressed or mentioned in this podcast is an endorsement or is meant to be taken as advice. It is strictly the sharing of our own experiences and recovery. Any feelings this podcast activates in the listener is for the listener to process and recover from. Any criticism you have based on these experiences and choices are yours, and they are not anyone else's burden to carry. Trigger warning, death, brain cancer, sudden death. Welcome back to Gray Maybe, everyone. If you're just tuning in, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you are a repeat listener, I can't thank you enough for coming back and listening to more episodes of Gray Maybe. Today, I have a very special, special person on the podcast. This is this is someone that I feel like I have a rich history with. Um, he is one of the first people who gave me a lot of work opportunities in uh, my professional career, especially work opportunities that had a lot of responsibility as an assistant. And um, I got to learn a lot from watching him and being around him and just having so much fun on the job and laughing so hard. Um, This is my dear, dear friend, choreographer, director, dancer, singer, actor, Ramon Del Barrio. He's also gone by Raymond Del Barrio or Ray Del Barrio. I'm going to Stick to Ramon, because that's how I met him today. Ramon Del Barrio, this guy. And before I even throw it to him, I have to say what the film that we worked on together that he was choreographing, which was a short that was mostly a musical. Uh, West Bank Story did win an Oscar. Um, I mean, I can't say enough. Frankie Valli, Cheetah Rivera, Sisterella with Larry Hart, worked with Michael Jackson. He was a solid gold dancer. If you know what that is, that's extra special and amazing and very coveted. Whitney Houston. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And he's got stories for all of them, which I you don't get those today. I Well, maybe he'll give you a couple. Maybe he'll give you a few little breadcrumbs. But I've known Ramon to have a very rich, um, powerful uh, past, present, and future in arts. And I'm so excited to have him on here to talk about something a little different that he is also an expert in that I don't think a lot of people know about him. So without much more ado... Ramon Del Barrio, welcome to Gray Maybe. Oh my God, Jillian, thank you <laughs> so much. I want to meet that guy. Who is he? He's so good. He's so good. He's he really like funny. Fun. You're, he oh. is fun. You laugh. You're gonna laugh a lot. You're gonna laugh a well, lot. Well, yes, we laugh through the tears. Thank you so yes. much for that intro. So great to be here, and I'm so uh, proud of you in creating this Gray Maybe uh, series, all of it. I've been watching from the beginning and it's just, it's vital. It's important conversations that we all need to have, including grief and an end of life. Uh, but uh, I'm just so uh, proud of you, if I can say that. And I just, yeah. you know, good for you. This is, it's very important work. 
Thank you. I know you and I have had a lot of conversations over time and space, you know, at different points in our careers, you know, like, I think a lot of conversations we have are about things that, you know, we want to do that we're trying to make happen and, or things, you know, that maybe haven't always gone our way or, you know, past projects that have gone really well and things that are exciting. Um, And then we talk a lot about future stuff. And all along these conversations we've had, um, you have, uh, in addition to being in the arts, um, you have caretaken for quite a few people in their end of life stage. And I also remember um, your father passing, which you told me before we logged on that today is uh, it's been 11 years today that he passed, yes. um, which is kind of special to be talking about him today specifically. Um, and you were there when he passed as well. And um, I shared the experience of the gasping breath uh just kidding. Made you think. Made you think I was dead. You you also had that that yes. experience, <laughs> which you know it's 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 touching and it's real. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm sure it's common, you know, but uh, to get to share it and and share in the joy of that moment at you know one of the the most um, tragic moments or transitional moments um, that you and I both have experienced and other people as mm-hmm. well. Um, uh, it's a gift in, in many ways, especially with my uncle's sense of humor and, and my, my family's sense of humor. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's real. You know, um, I think that one thing that I say is that I will never know the first breath of my child, mm-hmm. um, but knowing and experiencing the final breath of my father changed my life forever. Mm. Yeah. It, um, you, there's nothing that can com- compare you for either. Mm-hmm. One is hopeful and futuristic and, and, and there's a lifetime of possibility and the other one is final. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. So to uh, in about this time was the day in the hospital uh, and shortly thereafter his final breath uh, Mm -hmm. was today so thank you for you know in asking me to speak on this in general but that it happens to be today i think is some kind of uh, sign as well yeah yeah Yeah. because i uh, you and i just talked a couple days ago and we keep in touch pretty regularly um and i had been meaning to ask you about coming on to the podcast because i know you do have kind of a a rich history of dealing with people around the end of times, like being someone's caretaker and helping someone um, and and, and that person's family kind of be that transition, go through that transition, right? Um, And be there for those people. And so I thought it was, you know, only right that you would come on and discuss it. Um, because I had, you know, I um, Terrence Yates, who you also know, and you guys have had re- re- work relationships in the past. Yeah. She was her mom's caretaker. So she had yes. that experience. And you've done this multiple times over with not just your immediate family member, but other people that were just close to you or people that knew that you were good at this thing. Um, and yes. you had talked about it a little bit um, on the phone with me a day or so ago. Um, will you tell, you know, will you tell what you'd like to share about caretaking and how you do like you were telling me that there's you have a talent for this and I mean that you 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 kind of were telling me how you kind of walk in to a a place and you know where things are and you know what needs to be done yeah I mean I think that 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 is I mean there's it's twofold and 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 you as a a creator producer director choreographer um dancer um, we have a transferable skill set of details and timing and um caliber quality and uh and i found that those skills were transferable now i was uh doing jersey boys in las vegas and i finished a six-month contract when my father got ill um i left vegas and i uh, came back to los angeles to uh, participate in what was happening uh, which was initially memory loss and 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 what it was and and walking in being somebody who pays attention to detail 
I started to assess all the different variables. My stepmother, you know, what her issues were, what she was dealing with, what was happening here, what is memory loss, what what is the situation and what is needed and how best can I step in um, and alleviate and kind of um, uh, assist in things moving forward or smoother. Um, and so my father was my first experience of that. And I just, it felt very natural to be able to ask questions. I mean, we're also, you, you have to ask questions, you have to know, you have to understand, you know, that um, uh, very much like a performer, like, you know, I'm here, I hit my mark, then I do this thing that I transfer over there, I need to be aware of who's over there, what's happening. It's, it's all um, very much um, transferable skills. Emotionally, uh, that's another thing. Not everybody who's a dancer, producer, you know, like, uh, can just show up and emotionally, you know, uh, ground themselves to navigate these things. But I found that I had that ability. Um, I found uh, that uh, with my godfather, Joe Cassini, who also I uh, ushered into long term care and and had to navigate all of these different details that I could walk into the memory ward and just say, hey, everybody, and they would just mm -hmm. all come to life. And, <laughs> you know, I was like, look at you and look at you and look at, you, you know, and 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 um, not that the caregivers um, were not um, that way as well, but they're working, you know, they're serving, they're cleaning, they're mm -hmm. doing, they're navigating medicines. And so I could walk in and just, you know, um, get them to light up for the mm -hmm. brief period of time. Um, same with my father and that I knew that this was heavy. So, you know, I walked in and that is that is part of my personality is to smile and say, how can I help? And mm -hmm. um, and then just move into uh, fixing uh, or or connecting things that need to be connected. Um, I didn't really know that I had the, the gift. This is well, actually, um, when my dear friend Keith McDaniel was going to pass away. Um, and he had called me from Los Angeles and I was in New York. Um, I left New York and I went back to LA and whatever I was doing, I was like, uh, Raymond, he's going to leave. And this a was a while ago. When was this? This was. This was 27 years ago. I was okay. doing the the workshops with Gwen Verdon and Chet Walker, the Fosse mm -hmm. workshops, which mm -hmm. ultimately became the Fosse Broadway show. But, um, you know, uh, Keith was a dear friend. And when he told me that he was going to be dying because uh, mm -hmm. he knew, I was like, I'm going. Uh, so I, I moved back to L.A. to be there for whatever it was that he needed. And it wasn't until then that I realized that I had this skill where, you know, there was um, a bit of a, well, I need this, uh, you know, this person, uh, his his partner at the time needed this paperwork and needed stuff. And I just could open up a drawer and just is this it and and they would go that's exactly it and so i realized intuitively as an empath and as an uh, an intuitive person that i could also be led to uh what whatever was needed uh, in terms of paperwork and 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 all of that um with my father i didn't have to do that as much my father was more navigating the emotions of um his wife, uh, not my mother, but uh, his wife, and um, and also just, you know, being there uh, for him. Um, but then I also noticed other details, like nurses who didn't do the same, follow the same protocol, swabbing ports, doing things, uh, 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 you know, home care people I interviewed, you know, they were supposed to be awake while he slept or I slept and they were sleeping. And so I realized that, that once again, in show business, if you don't hit your mark and you don't, then you, you mess up the shop. You know, you can't do that on live television in front of millions of people. You can't do that because you break, you know, and you can't do it in a live musical because you could either get killed if you're in the wrong place with the set or whatever. You just, you can't, we really have a, a low um, rate of messing up yeah, there's not a lot of room for error. Yeah, no. not a lot of room for error for what we do. And and in in other uh, industries, not so much. And I noticed uh, in the uh, medical uh, field, 
the licensed nurse practitioners, the nurses, the registered nurses, the people like they're, you know, and I just started clocking protocol and then I started questioning them. And mm -hmm. actually I was labeled uh, the hell raiser in, in my dad's hospital because I would be like, why you're going to give my dad that breathing treatment, but you're dragging the tube on the floor. <gasps> like it just, mm -hmm. you know, there was just there. And, and look, it's a very difficult profession. I mean, after doing these things, um, out of the kindness and, and of my heart to people that I didn't know, but then also uh, out of the love, you know, for the people I did know, doing it as a profession, it's so difficult. They don't get paid enough. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there is something that I didn't know about that I had to deal with after um, somebody that I was ultimately helping, you know, I was doing palliative hospice care with a, 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 a Wonderful lady, Broadway star, Marin Maisie, but I just knew her as Marin. Um, but I didn't know that there was caregiver syndrome and that uh, that people who actually study to uh, be in this profession also have to take courses in psychology. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I didn't realize that there there is trauma um, that happens with professionals. Uh, mm -hmm. So they don't really talk about that. And family members are going through the trauma of losing someone. So there's not really a lot of conversation about trauma right. and grief that a person goes through having to assume all of this new responsibility and keep a stiff upper lip while navigating how they really feel about it. Um, mm -hmm. and so There's no I place kind of, to displace those feelings, right? Well, yeah. and it's like a social worker doesn't show up and say, look, now that you're here and you're going to be doing this, you're going to be going through some of these things. And so you need someone to speak to as well. So you should mm -hmm. probably like, it's not really part of the protocol. You know, everybody's kind of on an on emergency um, energy and, and, you know, do the best that you can. But um, I just found that my uh, attention span worked really well in, in uh, making sure the protocols were followed and things were, were done as much as you can, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it only makes it a little bit easier um, to navigate what is truly sad and what's happening. Um, with my father, he was fine, he had memory loss, but then he had a stroke and then he was paralyzed half of his body and he was a conductor, an orchestrator. So music and, you know, and in the memory loss part of it before the stroke, I would play him music that he had orchestrated and created with Michael Jackson, like earth poem and earth song. And like, he would hear this music and he just was emotionally moved, but he would say, I, I'm, I'm moved by it. And I know this is important, but I don't know what it is. And I'd be like, you created that. And so then there was those moments of like, Oh, wow. And then I decided not to do that anymore you know, to alleviate some of his disappointment and knowing that something was wrong and kind of just internalizing those moments. Was that disappointing for you? Um, of course. Yeah. You know, because you, uh, my dad was very humble. You know, my, my family is, they're, they're humble. They're well-known musicians in the industry, but not interested in fame. And they were just very um, humble people. And so, to see the depth of the emotion that he would feel listening to something that intuitively he knew he created, but he couldn't remember that he right. did. Um, and he would say, the boy, the boy, oh, I did that with the boy. And I'd be like, Michael. And he'd be like, yeah, you know. And mm -hmm. so not being a father, not not having a younger siblings or nieces and nephews that I was parental with, all of a sudden, this was the first time that now I'm flipping into being a parent. Mm -hmm. It's not just a caregiver um, versus taker, because we don't take, we give. So mm -hmm. it's it's the giving of care. And then all of a sudden, this, this kind of um, compassionate humility for the patient or the person and, and wanting to spare them any more um, possible grief. Um, mm -hmm knowing that they're going through something but so then i became more jovial more it's okay mm -hmm. oh don't worry about it it's you know we're it's great let's do mm -hmm. you go and do that i'm gonna go over here let's you know mm -hmm. here's a puzzle um here's some memories that i scanned and you can watch them on this on this dvd and so i got into like memory care and 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 um 
just being creative as a producer, like how can I bring as much to um, uh, the situation? And I don't re really remember because you're on um, you're in an emergency mode. I don't remember <clears throat> feeling my own grief until after. Right. Until after he was gone. I mean, and that's kind of what happens that you're on automatic. Or there could be family things where you get into fights with siblings or other people and you, you express yourself and some of it could be warranted and or other, other things can just be, um, you know, uh, things uh, you could easily set you off. So, but mm -hmm. I didn't really have any of that, you know, um, and you and I know, like now at, at this point in my life, I, I realized that I'm an empath. So, you know, I feel things and I know things before anyone has told me anything, if they never tell me anything. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just know what's in the room and I know what's happening. Uh, being aware of that and being able to work with that, it's taken a long time where before I would just kind of turn into collateral damage, yeah. you know, because you're, you're there, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, with the grief of my father, like today, I think, wow, 11 years ago, he took his last breath and I don't feel it in the way that I used to feel it. Um, mm -hmm. It's, an, you know, death is a part of our humanity. And mm -hmm. I think that our fear of it and our inability to navigate it uh, has to do with the lack of education. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that as human beings, we should know what we're made of. We should know at some point, biology should mean cadavers. You should mm -hmm. understand what makes us who we are. And mm -hmm. so then we might appreciate it more. We might take care of it more. We might um, understand it more and understand what end of life is. Um, babies are feedings and comfort and, 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 um, diapering, pooping, toileting, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the beginning of life and end of life is feeding, you know, toileting, um, bathing. It's really, it, it's, they're both ends of the spectrum and mm -hmm. they're, they're both just as important. One is hopeful in the beginning and one is mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. And if I think we were taught that as human beings, um, uh, we might at least be able to to navigate things a little bit easier. But most of us learn on the spot, like you learned on the spot. You mm -hmm. were like there and you were like, OK, I'm here. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen, dad? Or what needs to happen, right. mom or, you know, or doctor? And yeah. you just do it. You take the mm -hmm. direction and you and you and you go, uh, which is you know, what I did with my dad and subsequently I did it with my godfather. And then because of that skill set, I was asked to help uh, in New York uh, with a, another senior and uh, to ultimately, I didn't know that I would be doing what I ended up doing for Marin um, because when I was introduced to her, it was more clerical that she was fine and her and her husband, like it was just to kind of be there because I had this skill set for details. Right, but when right. I got called back about a year later, it was definitely. And um, I mean, what do you do? You don't say, well, I'll stay, but I need more money or or, mm -hmm. or I mean, like, you, you know, you're either going to care for the person. Regardless, um, mm -hmm. and in that case, I was doing I mean, there was. It was a lot. You know, yeah, you were doing tanks and yeah. chemo pills and morphine things. And, and just like you had to be ready. You had to be ready to pick the person up off the floor uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, navigate all these things. Um, and uh, the time that I spent with her, I was alone with her and her husband was was involved in a project that would take him, you know, out of commission for certain amount of time. I mean, I could always get in touch with him, but I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the, the arrangement that they had with each other was what their arrangement was. And I was the person who would be there, you know, for anything and everything. And I was really there for anything and everything. And mm -hmm. um, you just don't know, you don't know until you're in it. I mean, mm -hmm. really like with, with life, like you have to jump in, you, you can watch all the, the videos you want on the internet, but until you're doing it, it's, it's, you know, yeah, you, you know, you know. Yeah. What has, um, or has anything surprised you about grief or this end of life caretaking experience? 
Well, I think for me personally, um, what surprised me was was how much how much I could go on automatic to do what was necessary in the moment and not be involved in how I felt about it. I didn't really know that I could, um, I don't know if disassociation is, is I didn't, I didn't realize that I had this skill set that I could be like, it's showtime. Okay, it's no, showtime. it's showtime. I mean, it's showtime. Yeah, but it's showtime when you're changing someone's diaper which is like it's it's different or it's showtime like it's the, those are we haven't done those well, gigs yeah. <laughs> well but you no know done that it's, music video <laughs> but but you know i think i think obviously the the feelings or the ideas behind it are different but the 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 it's time to kick into what needs yeah. to happen and it doesn't matter if your costume broke the minute before or if yeah. you're late on your entrance or if something else went wrong the minute it's showtime it's showtime yeah. and no, you right. go you're into live. you're on the you're Oscars, live. you're in the front <laughs> you're featured there's 90 million people watching go. but i think you know? yeah and 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 it's and it's like it's either that kind of stress that we're used to or it's this person do it right in this moment figure it out and there isn't time to kind of uh, second guess. And I think that goes yeah. to kind of the skill set of the transferable skills that you're talking about. But yes, okay, so surprising you was in those moments, how quickly you were able to just do what needed to be done without any emotionality, you know, behind it. Yeah. It was like, you knew exactly intuitively what needed done, how to do it. And you just did it without there being yes. a lot of extra noise or learned or learned. I mean, in in uh the case of Marin, the first thing that I had to learn and do was be comfortable with hydrating her. And so that was a port. And then there was a certain way. And then, I, you know, although she showed me, she showed me how to do it, you know, to herself. So there was a, a level of comfort. And this is something that a, a loved one or a husband or a wife would do and can learn. But, you know, for someone cold, just coming in, I went, um, I didn't have to start right away, but when I went back to the apartment I, on YouTube, I was like, what do you do? How do you do? And then of course I'm a stickler for, you know, so they're like first establish a sterile area and do mm -hmm. all of these things. And then, but ultimately, you know, when it came down to it, she was like, look, I'll show you how to do it. And, mm -hmm. and so it became very like, you know, once the choreography is shown to you, mm -hmm. um, you do it. But inside, I was just like, oh, my God, okay, there's bubbles. It's like, you got to get the bubbles out. You got to, you know, this, you got to clip that. If you don't clip that, then it got like, there were so right. many things that could have gone wrong. But you you find, not everybody, but I found that, okay, in, in, in this state, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And certainly with Marin, I mean, she was so capable and brave enough to to just show me how to do it herself. I was like, look, right. if the person who's ill can show you how to do it, you <laughs> certainly could do it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, there's also, you know, it becomes a relationship. And so it was really the the friendship that she and I uh, forged through um, it all that, that strengthened me with everything I learned how to do. There was liquid methadone. There was, you know, I was mm -hmm. like, I was doing things that uh, I would have never thought, you know, I would have, I certainly wouldn't have volunteered for it um, right. if I, you know, but, but in learning it, I was like, no, you can do this. You can do this. You can do this. And um, there's just something um, through the grief that I realized the resilience, there's a resilience on the other side of the grief or simultaneously with the grief. There was mm -hmm. like, and once again, I'm generalizing because not everybody can do like most people are, you know, can't, they can't be in the room. They can't be around doctors or they can't, you know, some people are squeamish. Some people mm -hmm. just, uh, I found that I had this skill set and this gift that, that I would have never known had I had not shown up mm -hmm. to help these people. Um, which is what I take from all the experiences, including my father, mm -hmm. um, and my godfather, Joe uh, Cassini, and there was uh, Scully Freudenfall was this uh, woman, this amazing lady whom I helped in New York first. And, and, you know, she was still on her own, but couldn't get down the stairs, needed doctors, we needed to get her into a nursing home. You know, ultimately, the, um, the <clears throat> paperwork, you know, you need your 
end of life determination, you need your social security determination, you need uh, any burial stuff that you might have, you need to have your current medical records. Um, and it just became this checklist of like, okay, well, we need to get all of these things in order to get you aligned for the, the next level of care, the transition, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, okay, the apartment, does it need to be clean? Does it need to be remediated? If you're moving, mm -hmm. what are you going to take? What are you going to get rid of? They're like, mm -hmm. it became the musical of uh, transitional, you know, transitional care or, um, you know, I, I used to make a joke. Um, I still make a joke about it, but you know, I could, it, I could, you know, do a, an end of life musical called circling, circling the drain or circling around the bend or, you know, <laughs> almost there or <laughs> the end in sight, you know, <laughs> I, I think that would be really great actually. Um, well, I then think, I was like, what yeah. are you doing? <laughs> you know, dancing with the diapers, the diapers and, <laughs> and pivot and pivot and yeah. oxygen. Oxygen, you know, <laughs> and then of course there was that sitcom briefly where all of a sudden, you know, they're doing a sitcom where the, what the rich girl buys like a, an old folks home was just recently on oh, TV yeah. with Linda Lavin and all of them. And I was like, yeah, that's my idea. You You're know, like, hey. like, hey, wait, but it just goes to show you that, you know, I mean, I think that there are original ideas, but then there are, I just think that there are ideas that we, we all get. Right. Right. Or that. Yeah, that, that it, it, there's definitely might be a need for something in more more art in that area, right? Because we don't well, it's have an art form. End of life yeah. is an art form. I mean, yeah. it, it's really and un, not surprisingly, the people who are doing it are the Latins. I'm Latin, you know, all the people who are jovial and doing all of this kind of like memory care and stuff at the motion picture mm -hmm. home were Hispanic, and mm -hmm. they did it well. And the Filipinos and and uh, who do it well and you know I mean there are there are also people who by nature do it well mm -hmm. you know and um, uh, I I think that um, well people who care do it well it's not just Hispanics and Filipinos I mean obviously there's all uh, walks of life all ethnicities mm -hmm. um, one human race but many ethnicities but they're in the actual working field uh fields there are people who uh tend to be uh um my experience was at least the motion picture home was that it was aside from the the the, the registered nurses who were administering medicines the people who were running and cleaning and feeding and doing were the hispanics and the filipinos and and they mm -hmm. were brilliant they're brilliant when i think you, know. you bring up a good point about culture and how different cultures might, you know, either have more of a, uh, 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 more, more of a predisposition to be accepting of certain life phases because that particular culture, religions, things like that, you know, every culture kind of has a way of dealing with death. And I think some are better at it than others. I, I just think they are. I think, you know, I think, uh, certain more tribal cultures have always been able to embrace and celebrate kind of that circle of life. And I think that there are other cultures that have just gotten really far away from it. I know myself, I was raised Roman Catholic and death was not celebrated. It was not right. talked about. It was not like every, yeah, like it, it wasn't talked about, but it kind of was, but through like Jesus, like, oh, Jesus died for your sins. And you're like, okay, well, that feels guilt rid laced and like weird. Um, I didn't ask him to do that, but thanks, you know, and then like yeah. it starts and then you're kind of like, okay, so, but like it, it was, so we're all going to die. It, it, I found it, my experience of my religious upbringing was, did not help me with life stages. It didn't help bring me any kind of peace. It didn't show me any kind of way to process grief or any kind of way to have a process or a toolkit. Um, there, you know, it was just like this heaven and hell situation, which is like another whole like, oh, you better be good. Or otherwise, you know, you can do death yeah. wrong too. You could, you could fuck it up and now you're right. going <laughs> to right. Like, it's just so much like. <laughs> well, so, I, mean, I think that's also you hit it right on the the nail, like here in Hawaii. I mean, you know, the the community of people are Hawaiians, Samoans, mm -hmm. Vietnamese, Japanese, mm -hmm. Chinese, Korean, um, uh, Tahitian. Mm -hmm. um, most of all of these um, uh, 
these cultures embrace their seniors. They take mm. in family members. They take mm -hmm. them all the way in. Um, you know, I, 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 I won't say the Anglo uh, community, but I mean, I, I don't think that it's culturally, um, I mean, the Italians probably do it as well. It just seems like in America, you know, yeah, the, in the America thing is that we put them so away much. and we put yeah. it, we, we put in, the culture is to put them in a facility and let somebody else do the work. Right. Um, and, all, mm. and although Hawaii is uh, American, quote unquote, it was infiltrated. It was colonized. Yeah, yeah. It was colonized. And so, but as a people, as a culture, all the indigenous, which we were all, I mean, we're all indigenous uh, at our core in some way. Um, at least my mom is Italian, Hungarian, Romanian, Austrian, Jewish, Sephardic Jew. You know, my father is Argentine. So, I mean, it just, it it seems like culturally how we treat each other uh, as elders um, varies. And, um, you know, uh, uh, it's part of it. You, you know, you, I think that... Uh, religion is um uh is um some of the religious stuff like you know the washing of, of jesus's feet or the washing of the you know or the, just the idea that the pope would wash your feet like there are ritualistic things that are mm -hmm. reminiscent of the same kind of you know everybody should like you know you should when somebody passes you bathe the body you prep you know there's this whole send-off mm -hmm. into and it's just um it's it's a part of of the culture of respect and honoring and mm -hmm. um and also grieving i think that it mm -hmm. allows you to you know uh i mean i've only i mean it it's uh, as i think about it now as we went you know uh to view my father uh before his cremation he just i mean he seemed peaceful and he was there mm -hmm. you know i've seen other open casket situations where they didn't look well and they looked kind of waxy mm -hmm. and weird and strange. And there was, there, it was, it definitely, um, there are certain things that happen, you know, it's not always, um, it's not always the same, but, um, I mean, I know that, that I'm still, even though I've had ex what I would consider to be extensive experience in all of this, and you know, I feel very uneasy going up to an open casket of anybody right. that I knew because it's just, you know, it's there's right. a little there's a little disconnect. It's it's an understanding, or and it's not so much like how will I feel or will I be able to deal with it. It's just, you know, um, I don't know. We've all seen enough movies, you know, those mm -hmm. zombie movies where you just like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> are they gonna um, breathe? Are they gonna breathe? <laughs> Yeah, something's going to happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, once again, it's just a lack of 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 um, of education. And then there is no education on grieving. You have to yeah. grieve in order to yeah. experience. You don't know what it is until you you grieve, you feel it, and then how you move through it and how you deal if you act out or, you know, is is it's a life experience that everybody mm -hmm. has to have. You know, mm -hmm. and and it's at it's individual. You know, um, I think um, although I wasn't, I didn't know Marin as, uh, but for a year, and her husband, um, uh, we we forged a friendship. But my loss was was more of the loss of of the friendship and the time that I spent with her. It wasn't the same loss as all of her friends who knew her right. for 25, 30 years. I never got right. to share a meal. I mean, we had meals together where we laughed and, and we had our moments, but it wasn't like uh, she was in my life and I got to experience, you know, you know, her in her glory um, uh, as a friend. Um, so my grief was different. It was a caregiver's grief that, that, that was exacerbated by some, you know, the shit show that happens after people pass away, because then that's a whole other thing that there's personal grief. And then there's the, the cray cray that happens with family members or whatever in the memorials mm -hmm. and the funeral. There's just like this whole other element of it that uh, you cannot be prepared for. But my father, you know, I mean, the last thing that you would think that you would want to do is tell your father, it's okay. He could go to, he, you can die. Mm -hmm. go ahead it's okay to die and there we were going it's okay stop mm -hmm. breathing let go and you're like mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're 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 like okay well this is different i've never 
I never thought that I would be like, let go. Yeah. Thinking, you know, you're only thinking for the person. You're only thinking, you know, if they can hear you to free right. them. Right. And then, you know, whatever happens after is, is your own experience. So, I mean, my grief, I, I don't feel the pain, you know, it, it took a while with my father, um, mm -hmm. uh, with Marin, that was very painful because I had mm -hmm. never done, I mean, even though I took care of my father, it, it, it the, there was extenuating circumstances and, and it, it was just a whole other dynamic. Um, with Joe Cassini, who was amazing, you know, Salcedo, salsa master, choreographer, you know, worked with Marty Croft, like just amazing, was Anne Margaret's first dance partner. But, you know, I met Joe. Joe. He lived up, lived yeah. upstairs or right next door or upstairs, upstairs from yes, here or next right door? Next, right next to Right me. next door. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. When um, I would come over and visit Joe Cassini, you'd be like, yeah. Joe. I got to go say hi to Joe or Joe, Joe's, Joe's got something for me. I got to say hi to Joe. Oh yeah. And he would, and he was just, you know, you know how he was. Um, and he was, a, he wasn't Latin. He was an Italian from Boston, but you know, he was the salsa master. And one of my, my, I was on the East coast and I, um, and Joe had passed away at the motion picture home. And Joe had everybody dancing in the in, in the in the memory ward at the motion picture home. Mm -hmm. So he had like you know this one salsa step that the nurses would all do and whatever. And, nice. And uh, <laughs> his his nurse or the the main nurse Maria Maria she had a very thick accent. She talked like this. She mm -hmm. couldn't. So mm -hmm. when I spoke with her, mm -hmm. he was apparently an AFib, and uh, so you know they were trying to get his heart to stop. Uh, you know, beating so fast and, and she was holding him. And when she realized that he was probably going to die, you know, in her thick accent, she was like, yo, yo, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? <laughs> and he was a devout Catholic and he was like, yes, it is. She said, okay, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Our father who are having ding, 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 ding. And so she right. goes into the, and, and then so she's telling me this on the phone, you know, um, and and I'm like listening because I'm, you know, devastated, but I want to hear these are his final, right. you know, and he said, I, I'm a scared. And she said, don't you be a scared. The Jesus Christ is going to be there. He's going to wash away all you sing. All you sing going to be gone. So yeah. don't worry, yo. Don't worry, yo. Go into the light. Go into the light. And I was and just are you, like. Are you able to like. <laughs> oh, are you, you know. Were you I mean, like. I, I was like, how perfect that the salsa master had a Hispanic lady telling me yes. doing the Lord's prayer yeah, with yes. him. Yes, yep. 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 Walking you know, up to Jesus. The, walking him to Jesus. And then and then I said, and she said, and then the, the last moments of her life, I said to him, it's okay, yo. You're going to be okay. Jesus love you. And then Joe looked at her and he said, okay, I'm done. And then he died. Stop it. I swear to God. And, and that's when I just burst into tears and she was like, Remo, I had him. He went right to the light. He went to yeah. Jesus Christ and, and, and oh my goodness, it was a beautiful thing. And I was just like, oh, God bless you Maria. Know? I mean, God bless Maria. Like this woman was, you know, amazing yeah. and how perfect for Joe. Yeah. He could have had someone from Boston going, Joe, you believe yeah. in Jesus Christ, you know, and she could have been like this. Instead, it yeah. was uh, the salsa master went into yeah. the light, you know, yeah. with 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 a flavor and he and he broke on the two. It wasn't Yes, he, he did. He, yes, he, he did. He mamboed in. He mamboed <laughs> into heaven. So there are there are jovial moments uh mm -hmm. in people's passing as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and that's part of grief. That you go in and out of the 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 sadness of them being gone, but the the relief of them being relieved, and yeah. the the things that are jovial about the memories and and um, right. you know, I mean, the grief. Um, you have to feel it though. You have to feel mm -hmm. it. I, I it wasn't until after um, uh, my experience with Marin that I I went and I had to speak to a therapist. Like I had to mm -hmm. be like, what wh what's all of this? And he was like, oh, mm -hmm. it's a professional thing you know that that people who do this for a living go through yeah. mm -hmm. and um and it's it's called this and it's this and this is how you process it and this is how you you know 
you navigate it, which, you know, when family members die, there's nobody like I have to say, like, how are you feeling? You know, let's right. talk about like, it's not part of the conversation that, you know, you, if you've endured trauma and trauma right. could also be that you weren't there to help, but that they right. just gone and right. you're like, wait, they're gone. I wanted to, I can't, mm -hmm. I'll never, mm -hmm. you know, there's all different kinds of trauma, you know? Yes. Um, the misconception and, about trauma too, is that something has to qualify as traumatizing when it is your experience of it. So uh, different things are traumatizing to different people. So right. if you're highly sensitive, it may not take a lot, you know, and that could be traumatizing to you. It's how you experience the situation is what makes it traumatic or not. So uh, as you pointed out, there is a lot of trauma that can come with caring for someone or just end of life or, you know, being shocked There's by someone's death. Living. Yes, that's true too. Yes, yes, I mean, yes, just... absolutely. And so, you know, th like, I'm so glad that you went and talked to someone and, and in this process, uh, you know, with Marin and then other, you know, griefs that you've experienced, what did you find helped you in that process? Uh, you know, obviously accepting, you know, talking about it, finding help, you know, feeling the feelings, you know, is there anything you want to add to that as far as helpful? Yeah, I, I think that, um, what it came down to because in in you know in my dad's situation with this stepmom you know and and that whole dynamic was a shit show there was a shit show after Marin like you know there 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 are things that happen uh that you cannot be prepared for um and what what came back to me and what I eventually finally could really process was that uh the people that I helped were good with me. We were good. Mm -hmm. I did some things that my dad didn't want me to necessarily do. He was yelling at me, you know, you know, I'll wait for the nurse to change me. I'm like, well, she might not be here for a while. And so there were certain things that I did that he didn't like, but that I was good with my dad. Everything that I did with Marin, she was good. A matter of fact, mm -hmm. she had the decency of coming to me in what seemed to be an all night dream. Um, uh, basically, there was movers and and this is the spiritual part now because this like i'm also very connected on that 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 end so something magical and mystical that happened in this particular situation was that she was navigating and telling these men you know this male energy they were moving they were packing they were doing and i couldn't hear anything but she was in charge and she was you know uh and then uh who's the guy with the handlebar mustache uh, sam he was in um uh with the gaga the stars born sam not waterston but like you know um uh he's an actor not... with the handlebar mustache gray you know and I'm so, the and worst he... when it comes to like actors names he's um, you're good you, i'm you not think, gonna you think i would know his name after telling the story but i always All get right. it wrong but anyway he walks up to me in the dream and says we're gonna take it from here and i was mm. like all right and it was like an all night dream. And I woke up that morning and I just lit a candle and there I was in, in New York. And is that and guy living like, the handlebars? Yes. Yeah, okay. He's yeah, yeah, living. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in the dream. Um, and, um, and he, and I woke up and there I was, and I was like, wow. And I, I just like, and I hadn't seen her because from the time that I left, because my godmother was now I needed to be taking care of her 100% because she could no longer go home. She needed to be in a nursing home. There was cognitive issues that needed to be addressed. Like I, I took mm -hmm. care of Marin for the time that I said I would. And then a few weeks after, but I had to go because now my godmother was in, in a bad situation in Manhattan as well. So um, I had to leave. But from the time that I left, Marin was going into the hospital that morning. I want to say 10 days later, she came home and passed away. So I was in the thick of it, didn't really know where I was in, mm -hmm. in the thick of it because I wasn't asking questions like, you know, uh, what, you know, what are we working with here? You just show up and I was the Mary Poppins, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of, 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 of the, of the energy. But, um, I, I texted her, I think on September 3rd, you know, I love you. I'm still in your corner. I still have the text. That she, you know, because we text it all the time. That's how we communicated mm -hmm. uh, from the bedroom and the living room. And um, and she passed away, I want to say, on September 13th. So mm. it, 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 I hadn't seen her. 
for 10 days, basically. I spent about 400 something hours and two months with her. And then I hadn't seen her for 10 days and then she was gone. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, it was, it was in that moment that I realized that, I mean, she had the decency as a spirit, as a human being to come to me and say goodbye Mm -hmm. before she was leaving. And, um, she left that morning. So Mm -hmm. I woke up around 6 AM and she passed away at 10 AM. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and when I mentioned this shit show, you know, you're taking care of a person, but then all of a sudden when this person is on the cover of the newspapers, mm-hmm. you know, and then you realize who she was to everybody else and all of that, but you, you know, that, that wasn't the nature of your relationship, your intimate relationship. Um, the solace that I received from that experience, which now is five years, this September coming up mm-hmm. that she's gone. And then my father, 11 years, um, is that I was there for them and they were okay with what I did for them. And mm-hmm. the the only people, although other people benefited from me being there, my stepmother, Marin's husband, like they all benefited from being uh, alleviated of the time, you know, that they, they got to be away in process. I was good with these people and they were good with me. And that was mm-hmm. my agreement. You know, my agreement, mm-hmm. yes, was to these other people, but really it was to the person I was taking care of. And so mm-hmm. in these later years now, I, I you know, a, a thousand percent, I'm, I'm so good with the people that I helped over. Um, and that is, that brings me peace, you know, um, that brings me peace, even if I don't necessarily have a close relationship with my stepmother after, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, that was always a difficult situation prior to my dad passing and, you know, uh, other people, other participants, you know, um, what I do find is that, that when you're a person who is empathic, who does show up, who does the caliber and quality of work that you do and Cheetah had recommended me and, and Tom Viola and people had recommended me, uh, to um, Marin because they knew me and they were also mm-hmm. vetting who's this person. You know, when people realize what they're getting, you know, they're so appreciative and they're so, um, mm-hmm. um, uh, but when it's over, it's over. And so there's, right. you know, I mean, you could be there as the most loving, caring person. I mean, I love these people like they were my family, but uh, mm-hmm. after they're gone, you very easily are just treated like the help. Um, right. So, so you felt they received very... the benefits of your, go ahead. Yeah. I, I just like, I noticing like how purposeful that can be in the moment. And then once it's done now, it's like this lack of purpose well, in well, that moment. It's, it's like, what now? What? I mean, the purpose was the purpose, but in, in the, in, in the end, when the people who are still alive are grieving, right. You know, I mean, and you can't say, well, wait a minute, what about how I feel or how come is, you know, because the person died. So like, there's like this catch 22 of like, um, but, um, you know, ultimately that's, there's a reason why people who who do it professionally, you know, Mm -hmm. you might not want the, the licensed nurse practitioner that you don't really know who is like this, this Mm -hmm. person who comes in medical to do the work you want somebody like me or like you or someone's going to love you and make you laugh and take care of mm-hmm. you and just be like you know that you know um and you want the benefit of that but after a person passes away it just turns into such a different thing for all the surviving people that right. if you even if you do have a relationship with the people like in the in the case of my my stepmother uh or you don't you have a new newly formed relationship uh like in the case of Marin um it can end the same way, you know, and, and people are spinning and spiraling and grieving. And of course, because you loved my father for 30 years and you loved your wife for 20 years and all your friends. Mm-hmm. And I was just the person who came in and did mm-hmm. this particular amount of work in this kind of situation. Um, of course, mm-hmm. I believe that she was going to survive because mm-hmm. I didn't know the details and that's what I needed to believe in order to show up and, right. you know, continue to be in with my father. I needed him to see me happy and, and enthusiastic there to make whatever it is he needs, you know, work out, you know, you mm-hmm. spare them the despair. Your job is to alleviate that in the moment. Mm-hmm. And then you go quietly away or you do whatever it is that you do after. Um, 
uh, but that is, that's the job. And then, you know, that's why they say, you know, weddings and funerals are shit shows yeah. because <laughs> the, the emotions are high and, mm-hmm. and things are, you know, unrealistic, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, and, um, and, uh, so it's what I learned and that's having a spiritual experience. Like my father hasn't come to me and said goodbye, like Marin did. Joe Cassini hasn't come to me and said, thanks what you did for me, kid, nor has mm-hmm. Scully. Um, it doesn't always happen that way, but I think it mm-hmm. happens when spirit uh, feels that you need uh, that or that mm-hmm. it warrants um, uh, it. warrants it. And in the case of, of, um, of the latter, uh, you know, her coming to me was, you know, I say, you know, she was decent it, all the way to her transition. Mm. And, um, and not everyone's like that. Um, but you learn. And, uh, and uh, I also learned that you don't necessarily want to do that for strangers. Like I, mm. I, I, I showed up because I could show up and yes, I was recommended. And yes, I was going to love you and take care of you. But you know, you, you don't, you don't do work like that unless you're professional. You don't mm-hmm. do work like that. And I was yeah. paid. I mean, not, you know, like certainly. No but you're, yeah, but you're is, not like a, a, a person who's taking a ton of clients and showing up and that's your main, you yeah. happen to step into so that com- role. You for compartmentalize this. Yeah. and you've had the training and you can be like, okay, I'm going to love you. But like, you know, I was all in, I was doing healings like, you know, you know, with dad, it was, mm-hmm. you know, and Joe, once I got Joe and Scully into these nursing homes with the unbelievable, you know, couldn't have been done without Marty Croft, couldn't have been done without Tom Viola for Scully. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was the worker bee who, you know, um, who who took on the semantics and, and, and the logistics. It's, it's logistical. But the caring is just something that you do. I mean, sure, I could have just shown up and just done the job and not. But I mean, that wasn't that's not who I am. And. So I was going to love you and take care of you and be concerned about you as, as if you were my own, because mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's the job um, or that's how I approach um, the responsibility. Uh, you know, you're making them safe. You're making, you know, I mean, you have to be ready for any kind of emergency. I mean, and I had like three pages of questions, you know, with her, like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And how about this? And, you know. And it could have gone really wrong, uh, you know, if it went another way, you know, in, ter- in terms of resuscitations and paperwork and mm-hmm. things. And it's like I didn't have all the tools that I needed to have that would have protected me. And I wasn't working for a, a, a business that was bonded and, you know, a, a social worker would have uh, had all of those boxes checked, you know. So I, I got lucky in the sense that I didn't get myself into a situation that could have been, you know, mm-hmm. um um scary uh right but right. you know i learned that i could do it and i learned that i shouldn't do it uh for anybody <laughs> other than uh, than family you know yeah. i mean look if you called and said look and stefan was like ah uh, and i was like i'm there because i love you you know like it's there there are there there are reasons for doing it and then but you have to to take into account what the price you mm-hmm. might pay right. but still the person who's leaving if you love them or if you care enough about, you know, what's happening, um, all of that leaves and mm-hmm. you're just, you're in it. So, you know, grief, grief is something that, that passes. Do I miss him? Does it hurt? I mean, sure. Do you know, mm-hmm. it's, he was my father. Um, you know, do I wish that, uh, Scully and Joe had longer? Well, they had wonderful lives. They passed in their eighties. Marin mm-hmm. was 57. That's really, really sad, wow. you know, yeah. and, and, and I'm 59 and I was doing mm-hmm. it at, for her at 56 or, you mm-hmm. know, 55. And so it, it, it hit a little closer to home, you know, but it also right. made me realize that, wow, you know, um, we need to understand as well. I mean, we're such a mess, uh, humanity, such a mess, but we really need to understand the value. Uh, and I say to dancers all the time, you know, well, you know, you're worrying about, you know, this or that or the next thing. I mean, none of our friends or nobody's thinking about how they're going to die or do they mm-hmm. have diaper money 
or right. who, you know, and for those people who had kids, maybe they grew their own end of life care. People who have husbands and wives, maybe, you know, they have someone there who's going to take care of them in the end, the last breath, you know, um, we're not thinking that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, at 59 and 60 and 64, I mean, Chambers and Higgins and all these people were in our early 60s. You know, we're still living and moving forward and creating and doing. But unless mm -hmm. you have planned on how you're going to die mm -hmm. and do you have enough money to be able to die at home and, you know, whatever it is, we're not thinking about it. And mm -hmm. uh, it usually hits us in the face as a surprise situation, you can only be so uh, prepared for death, mm -hmm. death is death, yeah. you know, or dying, but the logistics of dying, you know, while we're trying to get more money on streaming, you know, right. and all right. of that kind of stuff. I mean, we need money on I've... streaming so we can die uh, with dignity. Well, look, I, I, I hope that I'm far from, from my end of life, but at 59 years old, after 30 something years of being in SAG, my pension is shit. Yeah, I look at the amount of money that I'm going to get to draw on and I'm like, really? Wow, mm -hmm. that's shit. And yeah. everybody that we see who's picketing, you know, they're the working people. The working yeah. people are the ones who have stopped working. And so yeah. for all of the rest of us artists who who might or might not be as fortunate all the time to be a series regular or constantly right. making money and stuff like that, we're in a different tier. Like I've right. never heard anybody speak about background actors let alone mm -hmm. dancers. So mm -hmm. there's like even tears within our community as artists that, you know, I mean, you might be able to get a grant, but it's one $1,500 grant. I mean, right. it's like, we're not really thinking about end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience of Joe Cassini with everything that he did and Marty Croft, the TV specials and the theater stuff and the parameters to get into the motion picture home, unless you have a shit ton of money or you mm -hmm. worked, you don't get in. Mm -hmm. Most everyone is not going to get into the motion picture home mm -hmm. unless you get there on scholarship because you know someone who can write a letter or who could do and then it becomes still the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The only mm -hmm. reason why Joe Cassini got into the motion picture home was because Marty Croft with, was his best friend. Mm -hmm. And he he advocated and wrote and did and whatever he did. But, you know, so even even us as artists or in our community as we're on strike and doing all of these things the reality is is that you know you have to become someone and wealthy and make a ridiculous amount of money before you're ever going to get into a place like that right and and we're not even talking about that so mm -hmm. <clears throat> as beautiful as all of that sounds it's still you know end of life care and and consideration is for the favored Mm -hmm. and for most the rest of everybody else who are the worker bees and just trying to navigate it, we're not thinking about death mm -hmm. and dying and disease and, and, and how it's going to end and let alone, and that's just paying for it. Right. And that's just geography. It's not about who's going to, it's not even about who's going to care. That's about, well, I have enough money to pay for someone to care for me. Right. You know, and our, and, end of life stuff is not it's so much more along the lines of how our medical and our health care is obviously because it's kind of one and the same but it's not what at all have. like our, our it's not at all like our post office or our no. fire department or our, you know like it's not it's not or like oh congress it, no or any yeah. of these other things where they get health insurance for the rest yeah. of their lives or they, they get the quality like you know there are certain industries that you could be a part mm -hmm. of where you're guaranteed certain things but most everybody else is on their own yeah and we and, we and don't that have that grief, kind of yeah oh yeah and that grief the grief <laughs> i mean there's one thing you know when you have enough money to pay someone or you have you can get what you need and you can get the assistance and you can stay at home or you could do you know money still makes it easier than having no money mm -hmm. if i didn't step in when i did with joe cassini he was gonna he was gonna die in a lockdown uh, on Western mm -hmm. and Sunset mm -hmm. because he had memory issues. So a memory ward was like four rooms with four men to a room mm -hmm. in a kind of caged situation, you know. And so I mean, the truth of the matter is, is like dying is hard enough, suffering mm -hmm. is hard enough, getting the medicine is hard enough, but the industry mm -hmm. of end of life and whatever makes it either better if you're fortunate or worse right right 
And right. that that grief, mm -hmm. that grief, that sadness of like, you know, oh my God, I can't let this person stay in in this right. situation or or like, you know, it's that's also a part of the grief. Yeah. Marin's situation, she she was fine. Mm -hmm. You know, um uh Joe was lucky, Scully was lucky. Mm -hmm. My father, you know, was also uh, with as a musician and, and, and all the, I mean, you know, he had mm -hmm. what he needed, but I would say for like 80% of everybody else, they don't. Yeah. And so you're subjected to situations and conditions and, you know, all kinds of stuff that make the grieving process of losing somebody so much worse. Yeah. And, and that's a mm -hmm. conversation also that when we talk about grieving, it's not just the loss. It's not just the sadness. It's the pain that you endure while the transition is happening, mm -hmm. which is, is, you know, I mean, we, we could go on and on about medical and health and coverage. Yeah. And I can't yeah. remember the last time I had health coverage through SAG. Yeah. How difficult I... is it to make $26,000 mm -hmm. in SAG? Well, you got a book. Well, a it commercial. is hard. Yeah. You got to like, and then it can't, and, and now the commercials are non-union. Yeah. Like, and the residuals, you, know, you used to be able to even, you could qualify through your residuals, but that's based please. on if you're actually making good residuals, which have stopped since streaming. Yeah. Nobody's getting I mean, good I get residuals, residuals anymore. I've been in some of the, you dance in some of the greatest movies and I get residuals for like $2 and 75 cents. Right. You know, and, and it's five territories, five different right. countries. And it's like, right. you know, so you know, while it's important that we're sticking together and striking and doing and, 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 and being involved in all of that, we have to also remember this is, you know, it's all the working people. Yeah. It's all the working people. I mean, those people who, who haven't been fortunate enough to work, you know, welcome to losing your health insurance. And it's difficult. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, so imagine everybody who doesn't have any of it, who right. can't get that any an of it. Anticipatory that grief. It's That's like, what it's called. It's such... It's anticipatory. It's it's almost like it's grief, but it's um, it's uh, it's called uh, ambiguous. It's ambiguous grief, anticipatory grief, and it's um, it's also called disenfranchised grief. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're. It's almost like you're getting like you're afraid of things that haven't happened that might happen because you, you know, you can't get in the game or you you mm -hmm. you know whatever it is. <clears throat> now, mind you, as artists, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you want to be an artist. You right. want to be in this industry where you have to audition and, and most everybody mm -hmm. doesn't. I mean, that's your industry. Well, that is the case in our industry. We we work mm -hmm. in an industry that is, is um, you know, full of grief, full <laughs> of grief. Well, it just all <laughs> stereotypes and things. And you've got to be the right kind of this in order to play that and blah, 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 blah. People who have nine to five jobs who work within a structure who do the same thing for 20, 30 years in, mm -hmm. in a structure, they still have these problems, but they are not, it's, they're not the same problems that we have. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. to this day, people tell me, well, you know, why haven't you left show business and just, well, you know, I've tried to do a lot of other things, you know, including helping people, you know, live until they die. Um, you know, making a living at it or, or making a living uh, in order to uh, enjoy life. You talked a little bit about um, things that helped in, in kind of getting through some of these grief processes, obviously time being one of them, you know, talking to someone, feeling the feelings. Was there anything like right off the bat that you're like, well, that was not helpful, like that right there, not helpful? Well, what what what's not helpful is ruminating, playing it back trying to figure out what could you have done oh better? Gosh. What did I do? How did I do? Why did this? Why, 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 why? Because I almost, you know, like you could kill yourself with why. There is no why. You do the best that you can and you get on with it. I did also do some creative writing. So um, if there is something that you want to say to the person or to the people that did you wrong or that you felt were like this or like that or the next thing, write right. it out. Write it out. Have the conversation. You know, say what you need to say. Um, in other instances, you know, for me, because I'm, I'm, I'm an artist very much and, and, and a, a song, singer songwriter. So I'm writing mm -hmm. some material, some songs where I'm getting to, to say what I mm -hmm. want to say, which is always, uh, that's, that's our creative outlet. You know, it could be in spoken word, it could be a song, but, um, 
for pedestrian people who, you know, don't utilize the, you know, those things to express themselves, a creative writing or just write the letter, right. you know, um, have the conversation, say what you want to say, cry the tears, uh, get the anger mm -hmm. out. Um, you know, there have been times that I've just, I'll go up to the top level of a parking lot here and just look at the sky and I'll just, you know, walk around. There's nobody up there mm -hmm. and I will just, I'll talk out loud. I'll say what I want to say. I find you to be very spiritual in this kind of like non-denominational way. Like you're in Hawaii right now with your family, but you also have always kind of been like this where you will seek out nature and you kind of like, a lot of times I'll be, you know, you'll give me a call and you're like, I'm just here by the ocean. I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the forest. I'm in the thing, you know, like I'm at the mall, you yeah. know, but like, you're like, you know, the mall. <laughs> Hey, the mall can be very spiritual. <laughs> It is yes. for me. It's like yes, church, yes. You know? I'm I'm part. You know. So, do you have like? Is there like? I mean, obviously, I feel like the more spiritual someone is, the less likely they are to be able to really define what that is. But do you have a belief system around death or spirituality that kind of you would you would have anything to say about? Like, other than I, I think so. Um, I mean, look, my mother's Jewish, my father's Roman Catholic. We grew up meditating. So there was Paramahansa Yogananda, Krishnamurti. So there was a lot of that influence. But then I also grew up knowing about Jane Roberts and mm -hmm. Seth material and spirit manifestation. And so as a young boy, there was, you know, I knew that I was empathic, I, 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 I clairvoyant in a way. I could have conversations um, um, with adults at 10 years mm -hmm. old that were, you know, the adults were like, uh, you know, <laughs> why are you, why are you this connected? Mm -hmm. Like, why do you, you know, um, so that was my path. Um, uh, I definitely, um, and I've been, you know, I was the kid who went and got communion and then turned around and went for seconds. Cause I thought twice that Jesus would be better. And then I was going to hell and don't chew the host. And I was like, who's the host? I didn't even <laughs> who hosted this, you know, like, <laughs> you know, so like, if a you're lot Catholic, organized... if you're a Catholic right now, you are dying <laughs> laughing at that whole thing. You just right. said, okay. Oh continue. my God. Yes. But I was like, look, I only got a quarter of the wafer. I mean, like I needed full Jesus that night. You know, I needed the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, but, but I owe ceremonies or ceremonies. And it's very clear as we could see with all of the ancient books that they were written by human beings who are seriously flawed uh, with judgment and, 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 uh, and misogyny and hatred and, you know, crazy. I mean, look, scientifically, and I'm, I'm going to say it, it's like, you know, she wasn't a virgin, <laughs> whatever. I mean, we know, you know, in burlap and sandals, it, it's not possible, you know, unless extraterrestrials were involved. That's not what that it's not possible. Yeah. Now that we know science and biology, whatever, if you want to believe that out of a situation, it was it was a, a conception that was uh, spiritually elevated and whatever it was, that's great. But, you know, when you think about what religion is versus spirit, mm -hmm. I mean, the spirit behind all of the religions mm -hmm. is the same. It's love. It's being um, conscious of the people around you, uh, conscientious, caring, um, compassionate. Uh, humility, being humble, um, all the things that we're not involved in right now. We're like egomaniacs and narcissists and hatred and like, you know, the, the flip side mm -hmm. of it all. But the common denominator in all of it is has always been spirit. And I grew up around, you know, spirit, spirit manifestation. Uh, um, um, and so nature and also my participation in Hawaii, my Hawaiian family, my tutu, you know, it's the Hawaiian people. And once again, you know, indigenous cultures, mm -hmm. they believe in the plants, mm -hmm. in the sky, in the four directions, mm -hmm. in the in the ocean. There's, there's, it's not, you know, they're called pagans, but there's respect for the ocean and its power, respect for the sky, respect for how you pick plants, respect for how they would uh, consume animals that they would give their life. There was ceremonial. Now we just did away with all the ceremony and we're just like feed and slaughter, feed and mm -hmm. slaughter, feed and like, you know, take and take and rip and do and rape and pillage and mm -hmm. rape and pillage. But spirit for me has always been like, you know, I say a prayer and ask if I can enter the water mm -hmm. here because I know that that water can take my life easily. 
you know, uh, we're living on the side of a volcanic chain at any given time. Life is so precious that it could be taken from us for any, you know, you don't know when your contract is up. So I've always grown up knowing that something greater was involved here. It's also why I'm so connected to my dance. Like we, you and I have spoken of this, but like dancers who learned how to dance and did jazz and ballet, and then we did dance and we made shapes and then we worked as dancers. That was a part of my life. But the dance that I do is, is greater than all of that. I could never stop dancing mm -hmm. because I might stop gigging because no one's looking, you know, uh, you know, for me, for the gig or whatever. But as a dancer, dance has always been spirit. Dance was what I did when I was being bullied. Dance is what I did when I didn't understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, and music, lyrics, you know, Elton John's Captain Fantastic album and like the music and spirit and dance has always been what has kept me alive mm -hmm. and keeps me alive today if i didn't if i couldn't do what i do in a dance studio and i'm not saying do pirouettes and pot de berets and stuff if i couldn't put on music and move you know and 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 have spirit come through me um i think my life would be very different it would be it would be uh, uh, abysmal in comparison but dance and spirit for me has always been what shows me that no matter how much I think I'm in control of everything, there's something greater. Right. When I dance and move and people be like, oh, my gosh, you know, the way you danced. I'm like, I don't know. What did I do? Because I'm not I'm not paying attention because I'm really not manipulating mm -hmm. it. The music happens or the, the space happens. It's a sacred space. You breathe and you move. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that spirit has always been a grounding force. So for pedestrians, again. Go walk, mm -hmm. you know, Richard Gere and Pretty Woman, where even a whore can find her prince. <laughs> um, you it's, know, it's a it's a it's a family movie. Yeah. You know, what what a great musical, <laughs> what a great family musical. <laughs> um, but but his character, she teaches him to walk in the grass, mm -hmm. ground yourself, put your feet in the ground, you know, sit and connect with the earth. Trees, you know, we look at trees. Oh, they're just trees. It's like the the underground connectivity, the energy, the spirit of, of, and the mana of the planet is greater than most of our abilities to understand it, let alone pay any attention mm -hmm. to, you know? So if you can't do creative writing, you know, go sit in the park, listen, listen to some music that will make you feel more or Go in the desert and see, you know, there's things all around us that are so amazingly awesome mm -hmm. that we have absolutely no idea how they exist and, and that are here every single day to remind us that there's something greater happening mm -hmm. here. And it's not another outfit to purchase. It's not another gig to book. It's not another house to buy or it's not an, it mm -hmm. has... When you die, you don't take anything mm -hmm. with you. Not one thing. Not a rock, not a not a crystal, not a it's all love. Mm -hmm. It's all love. It's all memories of love. Uh, even the trauma. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, trauma is an is an earth-based um biological uh experience, you know, spirit when spirit leaves our body, it's just mm -hmm. whatever it was that was making our heart beat whatever it was that motivated us to move throughout the day to mm -hmm. care, you know? And so that's why, even though as an artist, I've struggled as many artists do when you are at the lowest point, you know, as a, as a, a human being in society, government, medical, you know, food stamps, no place to live, not homeless, but really no home and all of those things. Um, and you can find um, humility and joy and appreciation and gratitude. Um, I know that I've never missed a meal. I know that the people that I care about, I really care about. And I know that it took me a while to get rid of all the people that I was feverishly trying to do and be a part of or whatever. Like you learn that the people that you have in your life that really love you and that you love, I mean, yes, they can still hurt you and vice versa, but I mean, coming from a place of gratitude is, is really, it's, it's not, it's not 
passe. It's not a, a kitsch thing to say gratitude and being gracious. You know, anytime I go out and eat, if I can't finish that meal, or even if I, I don't need to eat the whole thing, I will take half of that meal and I'll put it in a box and I'll find somebody out there who needs to eat on the way home to my next meal for dinner. Like if I had a meal, somebody else who didn't have a meal should be able to have a meal. And I see people all the time on the street. Mm -hmm change if i have a bunch of change i save all my change in the car i'll give the whole bag of change here mm -hmm. you know it's 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 and it's it's what keeps us human uh compassionate humans caring humans and it's what's kept me it's what's kept me alive and it's also you know um healed a lot of the grief mm -hmm. you know uh, there's no amount of money that i could have gotten that would have changed you know, granted, if it was like five times the amount of money, you know, for caring for that person or whatever, then at least after you could pay for a therapist, right. or you could go and buy yourself comforting things. But ultimately, the 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 um, the exchange, the things, the thing that is most commensurate with your love and caring, is uh, gratitude and love. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not in return necessarily from who you'd like it to be, but it's just the full circle is, is that. And that's what's kept me alive and healing and moving forward and believing that there's still a future and that we can heal this planet. I mean, what do you do with all these awful, awful mm -hmm. people? Like, you can't kill them all, <laughs> you know? And how do we right. love them? I mean, you mm -hmm. could, but then like, but like, how do you love, like, what's the answer to the situation we're in mm -hmm. right now? on the planet. It's like, how do we love, how do we change it? Well, people would need to just be like, oh, I have enough. Mm -hmm. I have right. plenty. You have, let me give you right. some here. I give you, you give me. I mean, it really is return to the simplest notion that there is no mm -hmm. lack. There's only abundance. And if you're experiencing lack, it, you know, look in your heart. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can feel gratitude, um, in the, in, at your lowest point, it, it makes a difference. That's why I've thumbed through, not TikTok, but these IG, you know, my favorite, like I'll watch, you know, undercover boss and just ball mm. and watch it back to back to back because it's so beautiful to see people. Yeah, like that return to difference. humanity, Even though, a little return to humanity. Yeah, yeah. It's like, wow. Or the guy who goes around and says, I don't have my wallet and you have some food. Can you give me? And they're like selling arepas on the side of the road. And the lady's like, yes, absolutely. And she gives him whatever. And she clearly has very little. And he's like, oh, that is so beautiful. Here's a right, thousand bucks. Right. And they're like, what? And it's just like, oh, because money's only it's it's man-made. Mm -hmm. This whole the money is fabricated. We're not it's not equal to the amount of gold. Mm -hmm. It, at Fort Knox, it's not it the m this whole exchange of money and wealth is a man-made concept. Mm -hmm. It's it's they'll just print more money. What deficit? Just print like if you're just printing it, the value of 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 it all has is so skewed. There's nothing you cannot buy the kind of love and caring and compassion and gratitude. Can't mm -hmm. buy it. It it it's not it's something you purchase. It's something that you um you cultivate and you express. And I mean, you know me a long time. You know what what my real life is. It's not my Instagram mm -hmm. profile. It's not my website. You know, it's not that the four paragraphs that sum up my my accolades. You know what my real life is. And what's the one thing that you could say about me? I tend to stay pretty happy. Mm -hmm. I tend to stay in gratitude and find a way to give. You are always you know, all giggling, the time, not just in a disaster. Always giggling and laughter. Always laughing. I mean, I mean, we have to. I mean, it's comedy and yeah. tragedy. There's a reason why it's like there is, you know, there is, um, there is a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it wasn't for my my understanding of joy. Mm -hmm brought through dance or whatever else it is that, you know, I do creatively or in just giving back, I think I would have a very different life and be a di very different person. Yeah. You know, and I think 
you know, you get that. Absolutely. You get that just you in creating these shows and creating this whole concept is, you know, from a place of wanting to mm -hmm. heal, wanting to bring conversations to the forefront, wanting to give people outlets to mm -hmm. speak and express, um, uh, take back your mm -hmm. power um, and um, and ending the shame mm -hmm. that usually binds us. You know, we're not supposed to talk about right. that or we're not supposed to or. or yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's that's. That's the quickest way to healing is gratitude. And usually at the end of these episodes, I have my one last question. And that is usually what is your suggestion for people who may be suffering right now? But I feel like you just gave like so many suggestions and that uh, overarching theme is that gratitude is to find, find the yeah, gratitude you where the, you, you can, can find it. Creative yeah. word, find the gratitude, write it down. What am I grateful mm -hmm. for? I'm grateful that I got to spend the time. I'm grateful that I've had this opportunity. I'm grateful that I... I understand the situation better now. I'm grateful that um, I have my health in order to be able to figure mm -hmm. this out. I'm grateful that although this might be this way, I have this. There's always something to be grateful for. Uh, I'm grateful for my ability to, you know, uh, write this down. I'm grateful for my ability to understand that this might help me. Right. It's it's. It's hard to be grateful when you're in pain, right. you know, especially when you feel that you've been mm -hmm. wronged or you feel that, you know, I mean, it's hard. I understand that. But the very idea that literally as as oversimplistic as it sounds, it's not the very idea that we get to wake up every mm -hmm. morning. I'm grateful that I wake up. I think what I think your point is right, um, Ramon. I think that w when we need um, you know, uh, to be grateful, it's, the, it's usually in the times that we are having the hardest time ha finding that gratitude. Like I know that when I am not my best, I am the least likely to be grateful. <laughs> and that's like the hardest time to sure. find the gratefulness and things to be grateful for. But I think you've really laid out like a path of a lot of ideas of how to start to find that it can be very small. It doesn't have to be overarching. It doesn't have to feel inauthentic. It can be real. And um, I just really love everything you've had to say today. I really always, I always love talking to you. You always make me laugh. Aww. You and I have laughed you so too. much. You've given me so much um, on the job experience and life experience and, and laughs and fun times. And uh, I just love you so much. And I'm so grateful that you are I willing to come too. on the pod and talk about some of your expertise and your experiences. Well, I mean, you know, it's there are my experiences and time and repetition, you know, expertise, you know, I don't, I, you know, you, um, you just learn on the job. And, you know, maybe as, as you get older, I will definitely say that, you know, it takes, it takes a minute. Some people will learn quicker. Uh, you know, people learn when they learn. And it's certainly taken me a long time to understand what, um, what what I've been doing and what I did and how I did it and how I could have done it differently and where I am now and 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 how I can move forward. Um, you giving me the opportunity to speak on some of these things. I never thought that I would would speak on these things. I mean, we've had private conversations, but there's a difference, you know, once you 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 put it out and and then also being able to speak on it without any vitriol or any like there's no pain there's no it's just matter of fact these are circumstances that happen and i could you know extrapolate from them these things and see where it could have been this that and the next thing and maybe understand and i just think as artists and 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 empathic people that we tend to overwork because we're doing the work for ourselves and the other people and you know we're you know, whatever it is, if it's a trauma response or if it's just naturally that, you know, my uh, my natural inclination is to show up and be like, what do you need? Um, uh, I have never walked into a situation where, you know, usually this response is, well, you need to take care of yourself and you need to. And there's never been a time, even in my worst situation, that I wasn't receiving mm -hmm. something. There's it's always reciprocal. Um, even if you don't understand what it is, the depth of it at, at the moment, there was, there's never been a time that I could say, well, I didn't know you, 
went in, you did, and, and this is what was happening for you. You were alert, Raymond. You knew what you, you might have overlooked or you might have discounted or, or decided that you were going to move forward when you were warned or whatever, like, you know, but we, it's always reciprocal and that's accountability and um, responsibility. And uh, those are the things that we're dealing with right now. We're looking at it straight in the face. We need accountability for actions and, and, and um, consequences. And so that's another healing factor of it. How did you participate? How did you, you know, how did you participate? And how could, you, you know, what you feel right now have something to do with, you know, what you agreed to or things that happened after you agreed to one aspect and didn't really know the rest of it. So, you know, I, that's, it's a very comforting thing to know. I'm not a victim. I've never been a victim, even though there were things that that I was victimized or, you know, things that happened. But, you know, it's like we all have an opportunity to show up. And and stand up for ourselves and other people. And I think that's what we're looking mm -hmm. at right now. You know, it's you see something, mm -hmm. say something. Something's wrong. You it's you know, you speak out. I'm I'm no longer not that I've ever been a, at a loss for words, but I'm. I've kept, mm -hmm. I've held my tongue when I sh could have said a lot of things mm -hmm. to a lot of people. I'm not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it mm -hmm. now because it doesn't serve. You know, there's, there's people need to be accountable for their participation in, in things ourselves, but then other people. So, you know, you, and you've always been very, you know, straight up straightforward you know and um that's one of the my favorite well but you know you, kitty there's lots of things that i want to say yeah. to people too and i do not say them i i i, I wait i practice pause it's called pause it's called you pause it's called you yes. pause and you don't do it even if you write the comment or the tweet and then you just don't post it so yeah so so hey. there's the spiritual realm is telling us we're done <laughs> Yes, we're enough. Done. Yeah, we're, shut it down, bitches. We're, our Wi-Fi <laughs> wi keeps going off and on, and it's crazy because we were fine for so long, and now towards this end, it's just like, and cut off, and cut off, and cut off, and cut off. Yeah, enough. Spirit is going, shut, we, the, fuck we, up. shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> You've said enough. You've, said You've enough. told all the secrets. You're, you're, you're going yes, down the rabbit yes, hole. Rabbit yes, yes. <laughs> oh, Ramon, thank I you so, you, so much. Thank you so much. Such So many great things were oh. said. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, too. I look forward to uh, your other uh, episodes and, 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 you know, other conversations. Thank you for asking me and uh, giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. I love you, Kitty. I love you, Kitty. 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 <laughs> Ramon has so many gifts and so many talents, but his ability to help those through the grieving process and through the end of life transitions is something that is uniquely special. His strength and commitment to do what is right for people he cares about above all else is commendable. His experience in navigating care, hospitals, and personal relationships is invaluable. I love that he mentions transferable skill sets that we as artists and performers have and how they have helped him to be great in the most serious of moments. I'm so humbled to know such a super talent and also so grateful to call him a friend. I can't thank him enough for his willingness to share the hard things with me and take time out of his schedule to discuss it on the podcast. If you're listening to this episode and you're experiencing grief, welcome. And I hope this helps your journey. You're not alone. Just a reminder for anyone who needs to hear it, you don't need to have experienced a giant catastrophic event or a death to experience grief. Know that whatever you're feeling, there are those among us who have probably felt it too. You're not alone. If you're listening and you have someone you love in your life that is grieving, welcome. You are also not alone. We as a society 
have a long way to go in being able to tolerate and help those closest to us manage grief. I've included a link in the show notes for the do's and don'ts, which I'm going to read here. Don't assign positive meaning to their loss. In our effort to encourage and support the griever, we may try to project the current situation into a better future way too soon. Saying, time will heal all things, is not helpful. Prophesizing a future positive meaning on top of the grieving person's crushing and devastating loss tends to minimize the griever's current agony, essentially suggesting that they sweep their pain under the rug while focusing on some potential positive long-term outcome. Stay in the moment with the griever. Follow the grieving person's lead. Be an attentive, active listener. Allow the griever to take the conversation where it needs to go. Make room for plenty of silence. Don't jump in to fill space with unnecessary commentary. Sometimes before a two-way conversation can even begin, the griever just wants someone to sit with, literally or virtually. No questions or words of comfort are needed to fill silence. Presence is often what the griever really needs. On their own, sometimes the grieving person will identify a silver lining or hopeful thought that adds meaning to their loss. This is a normal and often constructive way to cope with grief. Remember, the griever is the only person who can know what this loss means to them. Only the griever can make meaning of their experience. Once they do so, it's appropriate to support them in their newfound hope. Use the name of the lost loved one. While you are comforting the griever, all of their emotions are tied up in the loss of their beloved. Saying their loved one's name out loud is a way of validating the life of that person. Say Anne, not your sister. Say Alan, not your son. Say Stu, not your husband. Don't ever be afraid to mention the person lost. Grievers want to talk. Memories are all that remain after a loss, and talking about the person who died helps to keep them alive in broken hearts. Refrain from platitudes. Refrain from platitudes, religious or otherwise, like, they are in a better place, or time heals all things, or everything happens for a reason. Don't pretend that you know the answer. You don't. No one does. As a person who desires to support a griever, pay attention to what you say. Never say anything that starts with the phrase, at least. Comparing and contrasting your own grief experiences or dreamed-up hypothetical ones with the reality of the loss that just happened is missing the mark in several ways. Making your loss the topic of conversation is asking the grieving person to switch their focus and empathize with your grief at a time when the total focus should be on them. Don't say, I know how you feel. You don't. Seems to me describing how something worse could have happened represents a thwarted attempt to say something, no matter how unhelpful. Stay out of your empty word, ill-informed autopilot script. Choose not to go there. Be open to the expression of any emotion. As an active listener, be open to any emotions the griever may express through verbal or nonverbal means. Anger, yelling, silence, rage, disbelief, denial, crying, pacing around the room, shouting, rocking back and forth, wringing hands, clenched fists, avoiding eye contact, needing to be held, avoiding touch, etc. Be observant about what the griever is expressing, overt or subtle, and allow a safe space to be in that moment. Do not in any way tell them not to feel what they are feeling. Remember anniversaries. Try to remember anniversaries such as the birthday of the person who died and the anniversary of the date of their death. Sending a card or a text will let the griever know that you are remembering too, reminding them that they are not alone. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you were able to find something relatable in today's episode. If you'd like to show your support for this podcast, consider making a donation on Spotify. It would also be very helpful if you could rate, share, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to contact the podcast, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. 
Thank you to everyone who helped make this Gray Maybe podcast happen. Producer and editor, Roderick Barge. Cover photo by Jose Perez. Music licensed by Pixabay. Special counsel, Jada Ellingham and Roderick Barge. Special shout out to supporter, Patty Olgan. Until next time, bye for now.